Hey folks, welcome to a special episode of Passion for Sound, because today I'm sharing with you an AMA that I did with the patrons of the channel. So all the questions you're about to see in this video came from channel patrons over on Patreon, and I posted the full version of these responses over on Patreon for the patrons of the channel. The patrons were kind enough to agree to me sharing this video with all of you so that viewers of the channel could get to know me a little bit better and to hear my responses to the questions they've asked. So hopefully you'll find this interesting, sometimes informative, and maybe even a bit of fun. Thanks for watching and enjoy the AMA with me, Lachlan from Passion for Sound. I'm going to jump straight into it pretty quickly, but before I do, I just wanted to say I'm really tired today. I've had very little sleep for the last couple of weeks. Our uh, six-month-old wakes up every morning at about 3 to 4 a.m., and I have a lot of trouble getting back to sleep. So if I'm not quite my normal self and I stumble over the words a bit, I apologize for that, but I'll do my best. I didn't want to delay the AMA any longer. So without any further ado, let's get into the questions. I've got Jeff's question first, which is how did you get started in the hobby, and what were some of the earliest wow moments when listening to music? So I got started in the hobby probably because my parents were into music, not necessarily heavily into hi-fi, but we always had lots of records at home and a turntable in a couple of different locations. And so I was introduced to music and a wide range of music from a really early age. I've played instruments myself. Um, I've always just had an, in, an interest in music and um, both playing, listening, etc. And I started collecting CDs at a pretty early age, um, would have been 1984. No, 1996, somewhere around about there. So I was probably all of seven or eight years old, I guess, when I started collecting music. Um, and so the the process for me of getting into this hobby was really about the music first and enjoying the music and experiencing that music through good quality sound systems at whatever level. So it wasn't about high end, it was just about good sound. So to answer the question about some of the earliest wow moments, I think there were lots of them, but a lot of the times it was little things. I remember having an old, it was like an old boombox cassette deck and discovering that when I laid down with my head touching, so I'd have the boombox on the floor, I'd be laying on my back and so the boombox would be kind of touching my head with the speakers right there and discovering the sense of almost three-dimensional space that created. It was probably creating some sort of phase issues with the speakers, who knows? But it created a real wow moment. So things like that, and then I had, a, I remember a cheap pair of, I think they were Sony earbuds that probably came with a, a, um, a Discman or something. And I remember sitting in the car, I'd often listen to music when we were going somewhere in the car. And I remember those really blowing me away once upon a time. And so that probably kind of kicked me off on the journey and all sorts of other experiences along the way. Uh, that I'll get into, no doubt, as we keep talking through today. So on to the next question. Uh, Richard B. asked about also hearing the journey, so hopefully that gave a little bit of information about where it all started. He also said, what got you into the hobby? What gear have you bought and sold over the years? So I'm not even going to try to list that because I've forgotten everything, but what I do know is I started with a pair of, um, I think, Audio-Technica AD900s with my first ever kind of high-end headphone. Um, they were quite a light, they're still around, they're quite a, a light, very, you know, some would call it neutral, I'd probably say these days I'd call it analytical because they lack the base that is required to be truly neutral in my opinion. So they're very much a, um, a, a good starting point but very neutral sounding headphone. And from there I started exploring other things like Ultrasone, I had a pair of HFI 680s, in fact, they're still over there in my in my cupboard that they don't get used very often, but there's no point selling them at this point. So I've got the Ultrasones over there. I think it's the 680s. It's the, the ones that were in the middle of the range. So I think it was 580, 680, 780. And the 680s to me were the most neutral across the board while still having an interesting sound signature. So I've got those. Um, of Obviously, in the early days, iPods and... Um, the line-out cables for iPods to connect them up to external amplifiers. So I had a number of different external amps. I've still got the Fio E12 DIY was one of my first sort of high-end pieces of equipment. And then onto IEMs and things like that as well, because I used to be commuting a lot, both for obviously uni originally, but then more into work when I had the money to actually spend on this stuff. So lots and lots of different gear, starting like everybody at the base level. HD650s came in somewhere. Bottlehead Crack, Bottlehead Sex, which is the single-ended experimenter kit. Um, I had a, no, I didn't ever have an M stage. I was going to buy a Matrix M stage at one stage, but I didn't. Um, I can't think what my first significant desktop amp was. 
it's going back so long I've forgotten, but <laughs> but you kind of get the idea of, like everybody in this hobby, I've bought and sold a lot of gear as I've tried to understand what it is that I like and don't like. I just realized something else I should have told you about the journey, so I've, I've jumped back in here just to, uh, to expand on something that I missed the first time around. Um, with my audio journey, and I wanted to share this because it might give some extra context to some of my reviews, where I'm coming from, what knowledge I do have and what knowledge I don't have. So in my, my audio journey, I'll, I'll touch on as this um, AMA goes on that I have worked in car audio at one stage, um, and that was probably the beginning of my development of, of technical knowledge around audio. So starting to understand, particularly in cars, I started to have to understand things like directionality of sound, um, why a smaller driver is less directional than a larger driver, which frequencies are more directional than others being, obviously treble is highly directional, bass is very non-directional. Um, then probably from there, on a little bit there, I learned in car audio about things like channel separation. So we used to design systems, and in fact, my, my car at the time was built this way, the audio system was built this way, where I actually had two identical amplifiers and the idea was that I had an amp for the left channel and an amp for the right channel, whereas most people would do an amp for the front speakers and an amp for the back speakers. So by doing it left and right instead of front and back, it was all about getting the best possible separation of, of the channels so you didn't get any crosstalk where the left and the right bleed together, and that gives you a much better, um, sorry, much better sound stage and much better image focus. So that was probably the beginning of my technical understanding of sound. And then from there, I ended up having an opportunity to work for Bang & Olufsen, by this stage, I decided I wanted to have a career in training and development, which is what I do work in now. Um, but at that stage, it was the very beginning of that. So I'd done my course, my, my uh, qualification was actually in speech and hearing or speech therapy or speech pathology, whichever one you, you want to think about it as. They're all the same thing that, that lead to the same work as a speech therapist or moving on to become an audiologist. Um, and so the, the knowledge I had at that point meant that I had a good understanding of acoustics and our perception of, of music and sound. Not, I shouldn't say acoustics. I don't mean acoustics in the sense of room acoustics, but an understanding of sound, our perception of sound, what goes into how we hear, all of those things I, I understood really well. Um, and then I worked in an auto barn store, which is a, a local uh, Australian seller of spare parts, accessories, and car audio, all for cars. And so that job I took as a way of getting myself into business so I could use what I'd learned at uni to help teach people how to communicate better within business sense. What happened though was it also kind of sparked more and more of my interest in audio when I started working in the car audio section of the Autobahn store. So, um, so yeah, so I had the, the backing of my qualification added to the experience working in Autobahn and working with Car Audio, learning a bit about that from some of the specialists that we had come in and teach us about the products. And then I got an opportunity to work for Bang & Olufsen, which is a Danish high-end audio visual company. And at the time, they're quite different now if you have a look at their website, but back then at the time, they were really well known for both their televisions and also their audio. These days, things are a bit different. They're, they're still producing amazing quality gear, but it's, it's changed a little bit in terms of the it's more about the home automation and the invisible speakers and stuff that's part of the furniture. Whereas at the time they did have some really dedicated high-end speaker options available. So from an audio point of view, my time at Bang & Olufsen was amazing because I got to understand how they approach sound and also visuals. So their whole philosophy has, has probably gone a long way to my philosophy in, in music and vision, but we won't get to that because it doesn't belong here. But their philosophy on, on any product they produced was not necessarily to blow you out of your chair in terms of, um, I'll use TVs as an example, they didn't want the most saturated, bright, vibrant colours on the screen that when you first walk into the showroom, you think, wow, that's amazing. They wanted to set it up so that when you were living with it day to day, you constantly enjoyed it, you didn't get fatigued by it. And so what it taught me was that often the products that we first find really amazing actually grow tiresome over time because they're overdoing something to make it seem impressive. Whereas the B&O approach and what I tend to like in products these days 
is produce a product that's amazing across the board, but not shoving it in your face. And it allows you to explore the, the experience of, in this case, listening to the, the headphones or the products producing the sound, listening to it and exploring it and understanding it more over time, rather than having it all pushed down your throat or into your ears, as the case may be. So B&O was great in that it, it helped me identify my philosophy on sound that I liked, but I also learned a huge amount about um, acoustics there. So talking about how rooms are set up, um, understanding things like standing waves in rooms, and also the same information does apply to headphones in a different way, but understanding that the resonance of different situations is going to change the perception of us of the sound or not just our perception but the actual sound that's in that space um, so understanding things like resonance understanding standing waves as part of that resonance so why we might get a particular frequency boosted because the space happens to be the, the right length to create a constant bouncing back and forth and amplification of a certain frequency um, we also had a wonderful experience being able to actually go over to the factory in Denmark a couple of times. And so that was amazing because we got to do things like blind listening tests with speakers. And they had a pair of um, BLAB 3s, which are actually the speakers I have on my desk. And I'm not going to show you because A, you'd be looking straight into a light that I've got on so you can see me clearly. But also because my desk is an absolute mess at the moment, I'm rearranging things. Um, so... And then I'll, I will show you what's happening in the rearrangement in a separate video because there's some cool stuff that's just arrived. But the um, the point I was going to make, they had BLAB 3s, which are quite compact little speakers, and this was all behind a curtain. We all knew the range pretty intimately, and they played this music to us, and they asked us to pick which speaker we thought it would come through. And all of us were saying, you know, big, chunky speakers. And they pulled back the curtain and said, there you go, that's what you'll listen to. And it, it was just mind-blowing that such a small speaker could produce such a big, big sound. Um, so they have a lot of technologies that, that really make their sound special. And it's, for me at least, it's a shame they've departed that space a little bit. But um, still to this day, one of the pairs of speakers that has most influenced my excitement about audio and even my perception of what sound should be like was their BLAB 5 speaker. They had this huge down firing 15 or 18 inch subwoofer and then a series of, of um, other speakers. It was a, like a one, two, three or four way speaker, I think, I can't remember. And it had kilowatts of, of amplification power built in. So all BNO speakers were active for, for ages back now. And I remember walking out of the room, we were at the launch of this product. And I walked out of the room and somebody put on a track from the Duke Ellington Live at Newport, I think it's a 1954 recording, and it's got a drum solo, it's called Skin Deep, and it's got a drum solo in it, and I remember I went out to the bathroom, by the time I came back, I thought someone had organised live music at this product launch, because it honestly sounded like there was a full big band playing in the room, and I've walked in, and sure enough, it's just these speakers, and we're talking a huge, big, kind of exhibition type ballroom, and, uh, and it was just filling me with this most amazing sound. So the B&O experience was huge for me. And then my final step, um, and so both B&O and this final step, Pioneer Electronics, both of these helped my understanding of product marketing. So at B&O, I started off as the, the product and training manager. As time went by, the training dropped away and I did more and more logistics and product management. So I wasn't doing marketing as such, but I had to understand the marketing in order to understand the logistics. So I was in charge of the pipeline of products and the ordering and how much stock we were carrying and when the new product was coming and what we were going to be doing to bring that new product in and make sure everyone was trained for it. And then also training them on it, which meant I needed to understand the, the genesis of some of the products and the philosophies behind them. So that started at B&O, continued into my time at Pioneer Electronics. And that taught me a lot about understanding the behind the scenes stuff that goes into coming up with a product, designing it, producing it, bringing it to market. And so it's an area that I'm quite passionate about, just gently changing perceptions. When I hear people talk about a $50 product can be just as good as a $300 product and why are they charging $300 for that product? Or in the case of expensive products like some of the cord gear I've reviewed, people say, oh, you know, it's just, it's just overpriced stuff that's the same as everything else. 
it upsets me a little bit because I know the time and the passion and the energy that's gone into those products. And it's not about cord only, it's whether it's the cord product, whether it's a top of the range headphone from Meza or Focal or Sennheiser, there's been absolute time and sweat and passion and energy gone into these products. And people want to boil them down to the sum of their parts, which I don't think is fair and reasonable. So that's probably the final part of the journey that I thought was worth sharing is that having worked in that side of the businesses, understanding what goes into it, the, the logistics that goes into it. Jason Stoddard talked about this on the shit interviews recently where he was talking about little things like boxes, which don't seem like a big deal. But if you're a company carrying literally thousands and thousands of cartons for different products, that's space you're paying rent for, it's product that you're holding, and therefore if you've got an overhead, which most businesses run to some sort of overhead loan type system, they're paying interest on every single box they carry. Or in the case of, of tangible products like um, hi-fi gear, if you've got a, um, let's say you're manufacturing Hugo M scalers and TT2s, Yes, you're selling them for a lot of money, but you're also sitting on a lot of money when you're holding the stock in order to make sure you've got enough to send out to your retailers. So all those things stack up and it, it does upset me a bit when I hear people say things like they do sometimes around things being overpriced and not worth the money. And occasionally that's true, but in most cases, they're missing the realities of what it takes to run those businesses. So that's that's just a snapshot of my journey that I realized when I started to edit this that I'd overlooked the first time. I may have kind of retrod ground that I'm going to cover again later, so I apologize for that, but hopefully it gives a clearer picture of where I'm coming from, why I look at things the way I do, and some of the philosophies and, and thought processes that I bring to my reviews. So I'll move on to the next question, and, and I'll, again, I'll probably touch on some of these things as we go with, with more and more information. Snow Ranger asked, if you could start over, is there anything you do differently, or is the journey part of the fun? So as we were just talking about, I think it is very much that the journey has to be there for the sake of the journey. Probably the only thing I would change is probably if I could go back and tell myself or give myself some advice, it'd be to listen, listen less to what other people are saying. You know, forums are helpful and they help to guide you in the right direction, but there's a lot of black and white talk, this is the best and this is definitively better than that. And it's often not the case because it comes down to personal preference. So I think for me, if I could have started again, I might have started with different headphones. You know, I've got up on the wall behind me, I've got the ATHM 50s there. That's probably the first headphone I should have bought, but I didn't. Um, I went for the HFI 680s, the ultrasones instead. So there's little things like that where I've been swayed by different things and maybe made the wrong decision as, as a result. Um, but it is part of the journey. The journey's fun. And I'm only just in the last probably five years or so really settled on some of the equipment that I've bought that I'm completely happy with and content with. Moving on, Brocco had the question, this one, this one's a tough one. If you can only have one headphone, one IEM and one amp slash DAC, what will they be? This is really hard to answer in some cases and not others. So in terms of, I'll step through this headphone wise, it's got to be the Meza Empyrean. So these guys, and I'm guessing you've all seen my reviews, these guys here, brilliant, brilliant headphone still to this day the best thing I've heard. There's lots out there I haven't heard, so I'm not saying they're the best in the world, but I am suggesting that for me, they're absolutely the headphone I would keep above all others. If you said sell off everything except one headphone, they would remain. Um, the And there's another question that's gonna to touch on that shortly, so I'll leave it there. Um, one IEM would be, I think they're in the bedroom at the moment from some listening tests I was doing last night before I went to sleep. Um, one IEM would be the AF 1120 Mark IIs. Um, again, they're not the best headphone in the world or earphone in the world, and I may be about to receive in the next week a replacement that smashes these and becomes my new favourite. I'll, I'll hold that back as a bit of a surprise. But for now, the AF1120 Mark IIs would be on that list because they just do everything right. They're not exceptional in any one particular area, but across the board, they're incredibly good at giving good mid-range detail, decent bass, wonderfully smooth treble, and an amazing soundstage experience. Um, that's not particularly over enhanced or huge, but just really enjoyable. So they're a headphone or an earphone I can put on and just disappear into the music as well as analyze things if I want to. Uh, one amp or DAC, I think that's pretty simple for me, which would just be the Hugo TT2. Um, 
again, not everyone's going to love it. It's not going to be perfect for everybody, but for me, I just think it's it's absolutely brilliant. Obviously, if it can be paired with the M scale, that's even better. So that would probably be the one amp or DAC that I would choose, particularly because it is an all-in-one. If I was forced to choose separates, I'd probably choose the Shit Bifrost 2 as my DAC, and the... Um, would it be Shit Bifrost 2 or Cutest? I don't know. Called Cutest or Shit Bifrost 2 because I've never compared them side by side. I'm not sure. But Bifrost 2 and the amplifier would be the Burst and Soloist 3X, which has actually arrived this morning finally. It's sitting at the post office parcel collect thing waiting for me to pick it up. So that's very exciting. That's the amplifier I would keep if I could only keep one. Moving on, uh, Snow Ranger asked, what's one piece of gear that you really want to try but haven't had a chance to yet? That's a tough one. I do really want to try both the Focal Stellia and Utopia. They're pretty high on my list. Um, and some high-end electrostatics as well. I've dabbled in electrostatics. I've not been particularly impressed, and so I haven't put a lot of energy into following that thread further. But that's another thing I'm, I'm kind of keen to test out. There's also some uber high-end gear like the DCS Bartok, the audio bike gear. There's a few things on my sort of wish list for that that kind of one day flagship review and also just my own personal experience forgetting whether I'm, whether or not I do a review but they're certainly up there as well um, so if I had to choose just one I'd probably lean towards the Utopia and or the Stelia if I have a few choices I'd also include the Bartok and the uh, audio bike gear that I don't know enough about yet but I've heard very good things Moving on, Jack has said, I'm always confused with the power output of the amp. Is the voltage or the power output determined by, by the volume of the headphones? Sorry, okay, so I think what he means is, is the voltage or the power output, does that determine the volume of the headphones? What's the current's role in the output? And if sensitivity is the only factor that matters given by power, how will the resistance play a role? So essentially, how does power output work? This is a really interesting area that I'm still investigating a little bit. Um, I've got a review of the the Tin Hi-Fi P2 coming up, that's going to actually touch on some of this because it is quite interesting. So the, the way this all works, Jack and everybody, is that the headphones have a resistive load, um, and that means they present a certain resistance to an amplifier. One of the problems with this is that resistance varies depending on the frequency, depending on the or oh, basically no, sorry, just depending on the frequency, and therefore how responsive the driver is to the actual frequency being played. And that's where some headphones, and this, this applies to dynamic headphones, not planers. So with dynamic headphones, like a, a Sennheiser HD800, for instance, they have a spike at certain frequencies where the resistance gets really high, and that's because it's harder for the driver to move at that particular frequency. So there's a few things going on when we're talking about power and headphones and how they interact. The first part is that resistance, but part of the challenge is we also need to know that whilst a headphone like the HD800 might be quoted as 300 ohms, its impedance might actually range from 180 to 450 ohms. And I'm just making that up, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but the point being it varies. So that does become difficult to, to pick. Sensitivity is really helpful because it does provide us with a sense of a, a power figure that we can kind of use as a benchmark, but it doesn't tell the whole story because it's normally, the sensitivity is normally placed at a particular frequency, so say one kilohertz or 500 hertz. So that really prevents some challenges for us. So what I guess I'd take, or what I'd suggest from all of this, and sorry if I'm rambling a bit here, I'm trying to put my thoughts together as we go and I'm very tired as I said at the beginning. What I'd take from it is that Sensitivity is a really good benchmark for us to work out how powerful an amp do I need. So if you've got a headphone that's up in the 100 decibel range, almost any headphone amp should drive it. If you start to get into the lower 90s, you're going to have to think about which amplifier you're buying. If you're getting into the 80s, you're going to need a really powerful amplifier. The other thing to keep in mind here is the volumes you're listening at. So for somebody like me, I would very rarely get above about 84 decibels, 85 decibels for my listening, and that means I don't generally need huge amounts of power. Some people unfortunately listen at much louder volumes, and I say unfortunately because that is going to be damaging their hearing over time, and because of that, they are going to need more powerful amplifiers, particularly if they have a headphone like the HD800s with a high impedance spike. So there's a number of factors going on there. In terms of the question around voltage and current, both of them play a part. So what's happening with voltage and current is 
there's a, a formula which is the, the voltage multiplied, see if I can remember this right, voltage is the equivalent to the current multiplied by the resistance. So what that means is that as the resistance in a headphone changes, the demands of the voltage and the, and the current change as well. And likewise, depending on the current output of an amp, it may need more voltage to reach the same power and vice versa. What I sort of work with as a rule of thumb is that the lower your impedance goes on a pair of headphones, the more current you're going to need. So when you're getting low impedance headphones, you need a high current capability amplifier. When you're getting high impedance headphones, so you, your Bayers, your Sennheisers, they're going to need a lot more voltage, but very little current. So all that means for us and what, it, what we can do with that information is to look at the current available in a, a headphone amp and the voltage available in a headphone amp to determine if it can drive our headphones. So for example, if I've got a pair of high impedance Sennheisers and I'm running off a a low voltage amplifier driven by a battery, for instance, it's probably going to struggle with the high impedance headphones. On the flip side, if I've got a uh, desktop amplifier, it's got plenty of voltage coming in from, say, a 15 volt power supply, but I'm running a pair of low impedance, low sensitivity uh, planar magnetics, I'm going to need to check what the current output of the power supply is to see if there's going to be enough current available to drive those planars. It's an inexact science, and probably the best thing to do is actually look at the specifications of the amplifier to see if they provide the listings for each um, power output at each impedance. So good companies with thorough information will tell you things like the power output is 16 ohms, 32 ohms, 64 ohms. They might then say jump up to 150, 300, etc. So by looking at those, those breakdowns per impedance, you can very quickly get a sense of whether or not the amplifier can drive your headphones, and it also gives you an idea of whether the amplifier is more current or voltage focused. The Aurelic Taurus Mark II is a really interesting amp in that, depending on whether you're plugging into the um, balanced or the single-ended, it's got quite a different approach to current and voltage, and I can't remember which way around it is, but when I owned the Taurus for a short while, I noticed that it did perform differently, very differently, depending on the headphone and the connection you used, whether it was balanced or single-ended. So little things like that, just interesting to play with and look out, out for. But I'd say always look for the specs and check your particular headphones impedance versus the specifications, or at least the closest one. So if you've got a, a 35 ohm headphone, you'd look at the 32 ohm impedance. It's not an exact match, but it's near enough. That was a long one. Hope you're still with me, everybody. Um, Enrique asked, can you try to discuss EQs? or whether hi-fi equipment can mix well with pro audio equipment. So I'm going to cover this fairly briefly because I don't have a lot to say on the matter because I'm not widely experienced. But what I would say is that hi-fi equipment and pro equipment can absolutely work together. There's no reason they shouldn't. But do keep in mind that pro audio gear is not always the best for audiophile listening. Um, in fact, a lot of pro audio gear is very basic when it comes to the sound output characteristics. They're more interested in transferring the signal through into other devices and less so for headphones or studio monitors. Obviously, if it's, if it's recording stuff that's designed to output specifically to studio monitors, that might be a bit different. But in my experience, pro audio gear does not mean audio file. Um, why that is, I don't fully understand, but um, I, I don't think of them in the same vein. That's not to say that, say, a Pro DAC can't feed into an audiophile headphone amplifier and give you great results, so they can talk to each other. The question around EQs, my take on EQs is that um, there's a few things to keep in mind. One thing is that when you're increasing an EQ, you need to be really careful that every time you're increasing by just three decibels, you're demanding twice the output power at that frequency. So you can very quickly lead your amplifier to clipping, which is where it runs out of power, and that can cause damage to your headphones. So a general rule of thumb when I have used EQs in the past, this was more way back in my car audio installation days, what we used to do is rather than boosting EQ, what we do is cut EQ. So you keep it flat, and let's say you wanted to do a boost at um, uh, an 80 hertz boost to give a bit of extra bass thump. What you'd actually do instead is probably pull down the upper frequencies by 3 dB each and leave the 80 hertz where it is. You still get the benefit of an 80 hertz, 
a sensation of, of increased 80 Hertz, but what you're actually doing is pulling back others and therefore taking some load off the amplifier. So I think the the other thing I'd share with, with you with EQs is to be really judicious with how you set them up because if you start to spike by more than a couple of decibels, it might sound great on the track you're listening to, but if you then get a track that's been mastered differently, it can be really out of whack. If that track has a slight boost in the same place that you've placed a boost, things can get really out of balance. So I tend to, if I do any EQing, I tend to stick to boosts of no more than maybe two to three dB and just do it gradually and slowly and try a whole range of music when doing so. All that said, I'm not really an EQ user, even with headphones. Um, I can't think who it was now, so apologies, but somebody sent me the link to the Sonarworks software, and I did have a play with it. It's fascinating software, and it works really well for what it's trying to do. But for me, and, and sorry, for those that don't know it, Sonarworks is designed to apply a custom EQ curve to give you a flat output response from a particular pair of headphones. So I tried it with the DT880s, and it took the DT880s from being quite V-shaped to sounding really neutral and flat. On one hand, that's great. So if I'm if I'm mixing my um, audio for my reviews, it's really helpful to hear a neutral sound. But for me, the reason I don't use EQs is that I enjoy hearing each headphone's characteristics for what it brings to the music. Each headphone is like its own EQ for me. If I want something a bit brighter and a bit more analytical, I'll reach for the DT880s or I'll reach for the HD800S instead of going for an EQ. And that's because each of those headphones also has its own sonic characteristics, the, the timbre of its sound, the note weight that it comes with, the speed of the driver. Those are things you can't adjust with EQ no matter how hard you try. And so I actually enjoy the headphone for its entire story that it tells rather than trying to EQ a particular headphone to sound a particular way. That's not saying using EQs is wrong, it's just my reasoning for why I don't use EQs and just to give you a bit of an insight into how I approach each and every headphone that I listen to. Moving on now, Ainsley asked, and this, is, this relates to what we were just talking about, he said, I'd like to hear your comments on how manufacturers tune audio equipment, especially headphones. This is a really interesting one. So tuning's done in a number of ways. It's a combination of damping the driver using, say there might be fabric inside the, the cup or the shape of the cup itself can change the, the way this, these um, driver sounds. Uh, open versus closed, all of those can do it. And that's all about the reflected sound waves behind the driver, what's being absorbed behind the driver, and also how much pressure there is behind the driver and how difficult or easy it is for the driver to move. One thing I want to make clear here is that I'm definitely no expert in this area. I've got limited knowledge that I've picked up kind of along the way, but I've never actually done any tuning myself. So take all of this as, as a layperson's view of it, not an expert's view of it. So the damping and the, the flow of air and the sound waves in the back of the driver are one part of the equation. Another part of the equation is the choice of driver itself. Um, so obviously some drivers have their own innate characteristics, the speed of the driver, the, the um, amount the driver can move, so the excursion level of the driver and how much air it can push, and also the characteristics of how that driver breaks up. So a lot of drivers will, um, they're designed to move as much in a pistonic nature as they can, but the reality is they tend to break up as they move, so you get some, some waviness and some fluctuations in the driver's surface, and that will actually lead to distortion, which will influence the tonal characters of the driver. So that's part of it too, in terms of um, A, how much excursion can the driver do, what breakup characteristics are there, and then how hard are they setting that driver up to move so that they may or may not be pushing it to the point that they're getting more or less driver breakup. So all those things go into it. The final piece to the, to the puzzle is the, the fabrics they put in front of the driver, including the pads, um, but uh, and also the foam sometimes. But more importantly, there's often, you may see paper in front of a driver. And in fact, the Alessandros, these are a good example of that. So you'll see there's paper here in front of the driver. Now that, that paper is partly to protect debris from going into the driver, but it's also going to be tuning the driver to a degree. 
So they would have chosen, Alessandro Grado would have chosen, um, that was Alessandro slash Grado, that's not a person. So Alessandro or Grado would have chosen the fabric based on what they wanted to hear from the driver and what they wanted to restrict coming through. The same is true for the DT880s and the new T1s. They've got quite a thick foam pad in front of the driver. The T1s, T5s have the same. It's even more focused in the case of those. So all of those things are used to damp treble frequencies in most cases in order to pull back the treble and allow more bass to come through. So hopefully that answers the question. The same is true in IEM. So IEM manufacturers use different levels and different amounts and layers of acoustic paper in front of the drivers to pull things back. Beyond that, I'm not sure about tuning of balanced armatures. Um, I know dynamic drivers use acoustic paper. I'm not sure about balanced armatures, but I do have an interview coming up with Lee Massoni from Audiofly. I've talked to Lee a lot about his tuning approach. I do still think Audiofly have some of the best tuned IEMs on the planet in the sense that they have very always very balanced so they've got a distinct sound and tonal character but they're well thought out and they don't have too many peaks or troughs so I think Lee's going to provide some really good information on that one and I'm looking to do that that interview with him early next year so stick around for that one you'll get a lot more expert information on tuning from that okay so Kevin has asked what is your favorite ear pad material in terms of comfort and sound how do they generally influence sound of headphones and what are some particular combinations that you enjoy that's a really interesting question the feel of ear pads, I would prefer a velour in almost all cases. So something like the um, HD, I won't pull it down because the cables are everywhere. The HD 800, I like the velour feel of those. I prefer the velour feel on the Mesa Imperians and on the Nighthawks as well, and also on the DT 880s. So as I think about it, across the board, I would always choose velour from a feel. It's it's a bit cooler. It breathes better, etc. However. I tend to prefer the sound of the leather pads on something like the Empyrean and also on the Nighthawks and the Night Owls. So it, it really, for me, I'm always going to choose sound over comfort because unless it's vastly uncomfortable, if the comfort's sort of 90% versus 100%, I'll always choose sound. So for me, I think sound-wise, I often lean more towards the leather. Um, in the case of the Empyreans and the Nighthawks and Night Owls, it provides a better sense of weight in the mid-range and a bit more bass and so I definitely prefer that. My leaning is towards a slightly warmer, richer sound because I feel like it's a closer um, representation of live music and that's always my reference point. So for me I think leather is my leaning in terms of sound quality um, unless the headphones been designed with little pads like the HD800 and the DT880 but in the case of um, Headphones where there's often a choice between the two, I'll often lean towards the, the leather, it seems. In terms of particular combinations I enjoy of the pads, uh, I think I just touched on that in terms of the Imperians and the, and the Nighthawks and Night Owls. In both cases, I've got velour and leather pads, and in both cases, I keep coming back to the leather. The same is also true. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of these headphones. These are the German Maestro GMP 8.35, I think they're called. Um, I've actually got Dakoni leather pads on these, and it really improves the sound from them. They're, they're an interesting and nice headphone, super robust, kind of unbreakable headphone, um, but they come with really shitty pads, excuse the French. The, the leather pads are very shallow, and they're very tacky, fake leather, and then the velour pads... They're okay, but I don't enjoy the sound as much as I do with the Dakoni um, leather pads that you see here. At this rate, you're going to have a tour of my entire headphone collection by the end of this. So, moving on, we've got Snow Ranger said, I know you have the Focal, Cl Focal Clear and Mesa Empyrean. For which music do you like using which headphone? Is there one you gravitate towards more? If you still use the Clear a lot, any plans to review the Utopia or Stelia one day? And have you tried any headphones from ZMF or Odyssey? Okay, start off with the Clear and the Empyrean. I still own both. The Clears don't get listened to that often. Um, I'm reluctant to get rid of them because I still think they're a fantastic headphone and they're a really good reference point for me if I'm reviewing other headphones in that sort of $1,000 to $2,000 ballpark. HD800s, Beidonamic T1s, anything in that general range the clears for me are still the headphone to beat in that price range. So they're not going anywhere, but the Empyreans are absolutely my day-to-day -day headphone. And they're the headphone that 
I consistently, after listening to everything else, whenever I come back to them, it's like I'm coming home. I enjoy them. They're comfortable. They sound amazing with everything. So the Empyreans are definitely the day-to-day -day listener, but the Clears are not going anywhere. I, I do like the Clears a great deal. Um, they're just not good enough to displace the Empyrean. In terms of the Utopian Stellion, I think I touched on this before, which is to say, absolutely, I'm going to review them at some stage. I've just either got to get a loan pair or I have to have a spare $3,000 or $4,000, whatever they're worth. So at some point, I hope that will happen, but I don't know when because it's it's kind of up to a bit of luck, a bit of timing. And unfortunately, the local Australian dealer has a little bit of a problem with me because I used to be friends with one of his competitors, which should have no bearing on anything at all. But unfortunately, in his view, it does. So that one's a bit disappointing, but I can't easily get the Utopia or Stelia. The same is true for Fio, for iFi. There's quite a few brands that, that he sort of monopolizes here in Australia. And so that makes it really difficult, unfortunately. So um, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do about that yet. Um, other than keep buying second-hand gear and trying it that way. Um, as for ZMF or Autozy, I owned LCD2s, a pre-phaser pair, for quite a long time and liked them a great deal. I can't think what displaced them in the end. It might have been the clears, Focal clears, I think, but I can't recall for sure. Um, but yeah, the, the LCD2s were brilliant. I'm looking forward to getting back into LCD, so I want to try the LCD4 at some stage. Um, and also the X, maybe the 3. I would like to check out some more orders a year at some point, but for now, it's hard for me to justify buying them when I've got the Empyreans um, because a lot of the orders stuff that I would buy is going to be a direct competitor for the Empyreans and therefore I can't really justify the, the multiple thousand dollar expense of having multiple similar types of headphones even though they've got their own different approaches to the sound. So I will get there though. As for ZMF, um, I've got a pair actually on the way thanks to who was going to send them to me. I think it was... I'm, I'm trying to recall because I'm having Patreon chats and Discord chats and I can't connect who's who together. But anyway, I'm, I'm not even going to try and work it out because I'm going to say the wrong name and, and upset somebody and confuse somebody else. So somebody has kindly offered to send me the Atticus, so they're on the way. Um, I've also, or they will be on the way early next year. And I've also reached out to ZMF and they've agreed that early next year they're going to touch base or I'm going to touch base with them again and we're going to tee something up there as well. So watch out, there will be some ZMF reviews coming in the new year for sure. Um, that covers that one off. On to a question from Richard B. We've got, what other stuff are you into? Do you nerd out over other stuff like you do with audio? 100%. Um, the other thing I'm really into, there's two things I probably would consider my, my other passions maybe three things. I'm into cars, but I'm not heavily invested in that these days. So I currently drive an RX-8 Mazda. Um, I wanted a rotary car for years and years and years. So I love vehicles. I used to work in auto um, parts and car audio at one stage. I love cars. I love playing with them. And more importantly, I love driving with them. Um, having said that, though, they've kind of taken a backseat in recent years. So the RX-8 is about to get sold soon and looking at getting a Golf Type R, or sorry, Golf R, I should say, um, instead, because I do still want a car that's an enthusiast car, but I don't have the time to, to really fiddle with cars anymore like I used to. Um, the other things I nerd out over, I'm a, a fairly avid cook, so I enjoy cooking. So I watch a lot of cooking shows like Sorted. For anyone that's into cooking, check out Sorted on YouTube. Um, shows like that where I can learn new tips and skills and things to try in the kitchen. I wouldn't say I nerd out over it, but I am interested in it. The thing that I have nerded out over the most, other than audio, would be photography. So I'm a very, very keen photographer. Um, I've been taking photos. I sort of started back in high school. Then I dropped it for a while because, honestly, I wasn't very good. <laughs> and then I got back into it in recent years when um, digital cameras started to pick up again. And... In probably the last two to three years, maybe four years, I've gotten really serious about it again. Um, it's slowed down briefly while Xander, our, our six-month-old, has arrived um, because I don't have time to get out there and do the photography and then the editing. But I do spend a lot of time honing my skills both in the photography side of it and also in the editing side of it. So, um, yeah, I do, do a lot of photography. I might, while I'm sharing this comment, actually, I might show you a few of my images on screen just to show you the sort of stuff that I like to do, um, the, the shots I like to take, the sort of editing that I like to do as well. So um, that's my that's my major nerd out thing other than audio. And I'd say they're probably 
at the moment the, the audio is staying strong because of the YouTube channel, but at, at other times they're probably 50-50, whereas at the moment audio is still there, but, but the photography has dropped way, way back. So every now and again, as I'll talk about in a moment, I will sit down and edit a photo, but, um, but it's few and far between. It's once every few weeks at the moment um, because there's just so much time taken up between my paid job um, and then also taking care of Xander, our little guy, and then doing the, the videos for YouTube. So moving on, what kind of music, this is from, sorry, from Joakim, hopefully it's Joakim and not Joakim, I'll say both and hopefully one of them is right. What kind of music is closest to your heart, artists, genres, etc., and do you go to concerts? If so, what is your best concert memory? So, um, what kind of music is closest to my heart? That would be, I'd say rock and blues, so it's very much anything from that blues foundation is probably where I lean to. So music, rock music and pop music that's got that blues underpinning. Um, jazz as well. I'm not into what I call intellectual jazz, but I do enjoy more mainstream jazz. Um, trying to think. So so Duke Ellington as a, as a good example of that kind of mainstream jazz approach. I get into a little bit of Miles Davis, um, even into stuff like Thelonious Monk, I enjoy, but when it gets into the really um, improvised and unstructured jazz, that's probably where it goes too far for me, and I, and I drift away. Um, so yeah, more more the mainstream jazz, blues, um, some bands that I love to give you an idea. Some of my favourite artists would be um, Blues Traveller, Dave Matthews Band, although it's probably dropped off in recent times, um, The Cat Empire. Some of you may not be familiar with them. They're an Aussie band. They're amazing. Um, but then I also get into rappers that do really good sampling of great music. So um, Hilltop Hoods, another Aussie group, are amazing for their their choice of samples and the just the musicality they bring to rap. I really enjoy. Um, and then probably from there, I also branch into... I've found I, I tend to go towards a lot of the Irish pop musicians, so people like Irish and Northern English. So David Gray is another one I really enjoy. Um, Foy Vance, he's, he's one I would highly recommend to anybody. Um, just a brilliant, brilliant artist. His album Wild Swan is one of my favourites, probably of all time, even though it's not that, not that old an album. So all that kind of range of music. So I'd say pop and rock, but very much coming from that blues and maybe even slight folk kind of influence um, all that range of, of things from there so hopefully I've shared a few but I'm trying now more and more to share interesting music through the videos on YouTube so keep an eye out there to, to get a further sense of my taste as well and obviously it goes without saying to all of you if you've got any further questions on these I won't do a follow-up AMA video but feel free to, to ask questions in the chat and I'll respond to them as I can um, and yeah, um, Joe Kim, you also asked about concerts and my best concert memory. I've kind of got two memories. I haven't been to a lot of concerts, but I do like going to them when I can. My two top memories, I saw them at similar times. They may be, they're, they're a bit formative for me and how I think about music and, and live music, etc. Um, Joe Cocker and Harry Connick Jr. were the two, two really memorable moments. In the case of I don't know which order. I think I saw Harry Connick Jr. first. And in his what blew my mind was there was one particular track. The entire band except for Harry walked off stage and Harry played a song and sang and he literally moved from instrument to instrument and played every single instrument on the stage while he sang the song. And that, that kind of just blew my mind that the guy was so, so talented. Um, that was the, I think it was the album, uh, Star Turtle, I think was the album that he was touring for, or I don't know it was the She album, it was when he was doing the, the really good funk stuff. Um, so that, that was incredible. The other one would be Joe Cocker. And having seen Harry Connick Jr. not that long before, and Harry was still pretty young at the time, he would have been probably late 20s, early 30s, I'm guessing. He, he was amazing, music, musically speaking, but seeing Joe Cocker and Joe Cocker's ownership of the stage was a real eye-opener for me, and, and that sort of added another level of understanding for me of, of what it meant to be a performer um, and what these guys brought to their profession. So Joe Cocker just owned it, was incredible. And the, the whole spectacle of the, the lighting, the bit I remember was in, um, with a little help from my friends, every time the drum fills came in, all the very lights, which are those, those mechanically controlled lights that can change color and pattern and direction, 
all the very lights would go from whatever they were doing, they'd all point to the drum kit and they'd flash multicolors as the drum fill was happening. And it was just an amazing thing to watch because with the drum kits, they've got all the chrome edgings around all of the drums. So they were reflecting all these different colored lights. And it was just a real spectacle and, and really showed me the value in going to a live concert. The one thing I'd mention here just out of interest is that for me, I would always choose a concert that's in a more intimate setting because in both of those cases, I was sitting, I think both of them I was sitting in the upper level. So it was a, a two level theater and I was sitting only a few rows from the front of the top level. So you get to connect more with the music, I think that way, than going to something like a stadium where you're still enjoying the atmosphere at the stadium, but you're watching it on a screen. And for me, I don't like that as much as actually being able to see the musicians, albeit still from a distance, but having a little bit more connection, I certainly enjoy. Moving on, we've got two to go. Trav asked for a list of demo and test tracks you always use to evaluate gear, especially for Headfire. So I'm not gonna provide specific tracks here, Trav. Sorry, I, I didn't wanna list off a million different things. But what I do wanna talk about here is that when I'm evaluating gear, I have certain tracks that I use as kind of my reference points, and I covered a number of those off in my top five um, video that I did a while ago on YouTube. But the other thing I wanted to mention here is I like to listen to just my music, my list of favorites. So I've got a, a list here in front of me. I'm just gonna have a look at Rune for a second and tell you the numbers. I've got in my collection 5,576 as of today, favorited tracks. So what I'll normally do is I'll put on the gear that I'm listening to, that I want to audition, I'll start that playlist on shuffle, and I'll let it roll through. So there's everything you can imagine in that list. There's good recordings, bad recordings, there's dance, there's pop, there's jazz, there's blues, there's folk, there's classical, there's um, chamber music sometimes. There's literally everything in there, I would say, except for full-on metal I'm not into, and opera I'm not really into either. I think... Um, Pavarotti singing um, the really famous one that I should know the name of, and I cannot for the life of me think of it now. You'll know the one, you can write it in the comments. Um, but everything other than, than opera and, um, and full on metal are probably in my collection. So I just let it roll through all that sort of music because what I find is that it gives me a sense of the full range of a headphone. And when I'm doing my reviews, what you might notice is that I don't always talk about specific genres, but sometimes I do. Um, there's a, an upcoming review that probably will come out about the same time I post this for the Wave BNC cables. And in that one, I talk about how impressive they were with classical music. And so that's an example where by listening to a whole range, something jumps out at me. So with all my reviews, if I'm talking about things in general terms, it means that across that entire range of music, nothing kind of stood out to me as special. Uh, or different. Whereas occasionally, because I'm listening to this range, I'll hear something and go, wow, this is amazing on hip hop, or this is incredible for blues or jazz or whatever it might be. So I do like to use a big range of music, and I definitely like to use a range of music that includes great recordings and poor recordings at the same time. Um, the final thing I, I wanted to mention, and I think I touched on this in the Top Test Tracks video, is that I think it's really important not to get too hung up on specific test tracks and only those test tracks. So it's good to have a reference point, to have tracks that you really understand deeply and you know what to listen for, but also recognize that certain tracks are going to sound better on certain headphones. So if I was to pick up just randomly the DT-880s here, and I found tracks on these that I said, that sounds great, that's a reference track for me, that's all well and good, but it's a reference track on the DT-880, that doesn't mean it's a reference track on the Mesa Imperians or the um, Focal Clears, for, in, for instance. So having a wide range of music is really important and making sure that your reference tracks you've tested across multiple pieces of equipment and it needs to sound like a reference track on all of them. If you have a reference track that sounds amazing on one particular thing and then you put it on a different piece of equipment and it's just average, what you've probably found is a synergy between the track and the original piece of gear rather than a true reference track. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, drop me a line and I'll, I'll try to elaborate a bit more. Final question is from Dragon3250. Your music listening habits and how or if the seasons, music theory, content, etc. affect or change them. So 
I don't have a lot of listening habits. Um, I really liked your, your approach. That was really fun to read, so thanks for sharing that. I think for me, my listening habits come into two things. One of them is that I do have playlists set up by mood, and I, and I mean that in very, very broad terms. So I've got a mellow playlist, and I've got an upbeat playlist. Once upon a time, I broke it down further than that, so I had like cruisy or relaxing. I had mellow when it was more more somber. If I was having a pretty flat day, I might have listened to those. If I wanted to wallow in my own pity a little bit. Um, and then I had my upbeat. I had some funky. I had a party playlist. So at one stage, I did have a whole range. But I think because I'm commuting less now, and also because time is, is I've got less and less time available, and my approach to listening to music has had to change because technology has changed. I think it's shifted. So that was great when I used to listen from an iPod plugged into a pair of speakers or, or a dock. Whereas nowadays, most of the time I'm streaming through Sonos around the house or through um, Rune here in my office. And so it doesn't suit those playlists quite as easily as my old setup. So what I've got now instead is I've got all my favorites flagged in, in Rune. But what I'm also tending to do is um, I'll listen to more albums one at a time now and less so playlists. In fact, one thing I'm doing at the moment, and this is partly for the channel, partly for my own interest, is, and, and actually as I think about it, this kind of, kind of goes all the way back full circle to the beginning. Once upon a time, I had a CD collection where I knew every single track on every single CD intimately. So somebody could walk into my collection and say, Here's the, you know, here's a track name, and I'd say, oh, this person's done it, it's on you know, track six on that album, this person's also done it, it's track two on that album, they've done another version that was live, and it's on this album, and it's this track number. So I had this really intimate knowledge of my music collection because I was listening to them all so often. Whereas nowadays, I've got a, a total collection of, uh, looks like about 54,000 songs in my collection, let alone through streaming services. I don't know the music as well as I used to, I don't know what the songs are about sometimes, so I haven't taken the time to understand the lyrics. I might have cherry-picked the best tracks out of an album, but I don't know the album intimately either. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm actually sitting and listening to whole albums at a time, and I'm building a new playlist of my favourite albums. So it's those albums that, whether or not they've got two favourite tracks or ten favourite tracks, if I get to the end of the album and I think I want to listen to that again, then it goes into my favorite albums list. Whereas there are albums that I've got one or two tracks that I adore, but I get to the end of the album, I go, that's enough, I don't need any more. So I'm gradually building a playlist of my favorite albums. I think at the moment it's got, uh, I can't get to it easy, I won't waste your time doing it, but I think it's probably got about 30 or so albums in it at the moment. Um, and in fact, it's on title. So let me know in the comments if you want me to, I'm, I'm happy to share my favorite albums playlist and you can get a sense of the stuff that I'm really thoroughly enjoy, but also know that it is a work in progress, so it's building as we go. The final thing I want to mention about my listening habits is my sort of serious listening to music or, or my, my opportunities for listening to music are twofold. One of them is when I do my, my paid job. So my paid job is I do learning design, organizational development work. And so when I'm working on um, on learning programs or strategy or um, session outlines and, and program outlines to help my clients deliver training and make behavioral changes in their organizations, what I'll often do is I'll put on music while I do that work. So I'm sitting at my desk, I'm sort of a captive audience, and I can enjoy my headphones and my music that way. Um, I do also listen a lot around the house, but it's normally background music through the Sonos, so I'm not paying a great deal of attention. The other thing is, I mentioned earlier that I'm heavily into photography, so what I'll often do is when I sit down to edit photos, that's very much my focused listening time. So I'm taking in the music, but I'm also editing the photo at the same time. Um, so they're probably the main times and my main listening habits is when I'm at my desk, depending on the sort of work I'm doing, and what I tend to be listening to at the moment when I'm doing those things is I'll tend to be going through my albums and finding those favorite albums and also identifying some favorite tracks along the way for potential future reviews and, and testing of equipment. So I think I've answered all the questions. Hopefully that was informative and interesting to you. For now though, I'll sign off. So happy listening, enjoy the music, and I'll see you again soon. Thanks guys, bye.